Thank you, um, Beth, Jane, and Peter, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight. What I'd like to do tonight, if the system doesn't uh, go out, is to uh, give you a d description of the, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to jettison this and just use the regular microphone, which, and you know, and I don't even need a, m need a microphone. I'll just use what I have. Um, <laughs> What I'd like to do for you tonight is to give you a synopsis of the genesis of the Troops Lecture Program, which also means giving you a synopsis of how AIA dealt with the um, armed intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan um, in, uh, well, of a few years ago, in 2001 and 2003. I'd like to give you a sense of how I've organized the lectures that I give to the troops who are uh, deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan, and also to give you a sense of, um, to give you a kind of update on the museum situation in Baghdad and Kabul. The um, AIA, of course, has a long history of working with the military in the event of armed conflict, especially in World War II. The AIA worked with the US Armed Forces on identifying sites of cultural significance and also um, working on the repatriation of works of art and antiquities um, that had left their country of origin as a consequence of armed conflict. <clears throat> but we hadn't done anything recently in terms of active work with the military. And when armed intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan began, we weren't really sure what to do because it had been nearly 60 years since we had worked closely with the military. Those outreach efforts had really been allowed to fall by the wayside to an extent. And we didn't really get started until after the destruction and looting of the Iraq uh, Archaeological Museum in Baghdad. And of course, that's what you're seeing on the screen. Some of the statues from Hatra broken in the destruction. Other uh, antiquities from the museum broken. Donnie George, the um, former director of the Iraq uh, Archaeological Museum, holding some of the pieces that were um, recovered by the museum with the assistance uh, of the Marines. After this happened, we realized that we needed to do something. We simply weren't sure what it was that we needed to do. So I talked to Jane Waldbaum. We agreed to set up uh, an Iraq-Afghanistan Rapid Reaction Force which seemed to be what everyone else did in the event of um, extraordinary emergencies. And um, the first thing that we did, I asked David Packard and the Packard Humanities Institute for some seed money so that we could bring archaeologists from Iraq and Afghanistan to the US, talk to them, and get a sense of the ways in which we could be most potentially productive. And I simply called David Packard on the phone. He was wonderful, immediately pledged funding for this. And we began preparation for a conference at the AIA meetings in 2004, where we intended to bring Abdul Wasi Firuzi, director of the Afghanistan Antiquity Service, um, to the annual meeting, and also Donnie George to the annual meeting. We did, of course, bring Dr. Firuzi to the meetings. We could not bring Donnie George because <clears throat> his immediate superior was killed in Jordan shortly before the meetings were to take place, and the responsibilities that fell on his shoulders were simply too great for him to undertake uh, a journey to the States. But we had this conference, which you see here, with Jane Abdul Wasi Firuzi, John Russell, David Stronach, Neil Brody, and Patty Gerstenblith, where we explored some of the issues of the dangers to cultural property in Iraq and Afghanistan and tried to determine what we what important role we could play in ameliorating the situation. When I had lunch one day with Dr. Firuzi, he said, you know, regardless of what one thinks of these wars, your soldiers are now guarding the sites and the museums of Afghanistan. And in a lot of cases, it, it's not clear that they know what they're guarding. And of course, how could they? Very few of us study intensively Iraq and Afghanistan in the course of primary and secondary education. And he said, it, it's too bad you can't just tell them what's important. And then I thought, what a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start a troops lecture program. I mean, I felt like Mickey Rooney in an old MGM musical. <laughs> Let's put on a show. 
And so I said, let's, let's give lectures by the AIA archaeologists to all of the troops who are going to be deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan. Let's tell them what archaeology is about. Let's give them a cultural history of the area. And as a consequence, they'll take their jobs of guarding and protecting the archaeological sites and museums of these regions far more seriously. And he said, fine, you do that. That's a great idea. And then he went back to Afghanistan, <coughs> and I had to figure out how to do it. Working with the military was not something that I had ever done. And initially, I had no idea how to do it. The only reason I was successful in doing it was because I was able to turn to Colonel Matthew Bogdanos from the Marine Corps, who was in charge of repatriating the antiquities that had been looted from the Iraq Museum in Baghdad. And you're seeing Colonel Bogdanos in the museum on the top and um, the state that he found the museum in when he went in um, to begin his process of repatriating what had been taken. Although um, I didn't, I hadn't talked to Matthew Bogdanos in a very, very long time, we had been in graduate school together. He had a master's degree in Hellenistic history from Columbia University, and I was in graduate school in classical archaeology there at the same time. We had traveled in different social circles, but still, <laughs> I uh, knew him vaguely, and he knew my name. Um, and so I approached him and said, I'd like to start a troops lecture program. I have no idea what to do. Do I write a letter to Donald Rumsfeld? Why would Donald Rumsfeld open my mail when he's getting <laughs> thousands of letters from a lot of other people whose names he knows? And he said, don't write to Donald Rumsfeld. He won't open your mail. <laughs> but, um, but what you can do is write to General Abizaid who was in uh, the head of the U.S. Central Command, and he will open your mail because I'm going to help on this. Um, Matthew Bogdanos is not just a M Marine Corps colonel and um, a student of Hellenistic history. He's also an assistant district attorney and has a very good mind for how to move through administrative channels. Some of you will have read uh, about his exploits in the headlines of the New York Times when he prosecuted Puff Daddy for whatever it was that Puff Daddy was allegedly uh, guilty of having done. <laughs> In any event, um, he said, write a proposal. Um, don't dumb it down because the military is smart. People think they're not, but they are. Don't make it too long because they're busy. So don't make it longer than a page and send it to me and I'll vet it. And so I wrote a proposal and sent it to him. And I thought I had uh, been very careful in my wording. <coughs> I've worked with some unusual figures in the field in Turkey, and so I tried to develop early on diplomatic skills that would enable me to sail through those experiences. But you can never learn diplomacy to the extent that you need to. As I found out when Matthew um, vetted my proposal, I had said words to the effect of, there will be no discussion as to whether, th that these talks that I would give would be politically neutral. They were educational, they were not political, there would be no discussion as to whether the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were or were not justified. It would be solely uh, for um, information and for giving the troops a sense of the cultures that with which they would be dealing. <coughs> And Matthew read this and said, what do you mean not justified? This makes it sound like you think the war wasn't justified. And if you send, send that to the US Central Command, they're going to throw it in the trash can. You can't write like that. And um, without his assistance, as I say, I would never have been able to craft the kind of proposal that would have made it through um, the US Central Command. And I never would have been able to, to have gotten it approved without his active intervention. It took nine months. But um, ultimately, it was approved, <coughs> and we began the lectures in 2004. So they've been going on for two years. Now, when I started this, getting a, le a lecture series like this approved by the US Central Command isn't enough. You have to identify the bases, and then you have to do it all again with the officers at those bases. So it's fine that General Abizade said, go ahead and do it. But you need to identify the officers at the bases who can say, we'll make this a part of pre-deployment training. So that was another kind of education in and of itself. And I didn't really know 